Marines is so much like the martial arts. It's a family. What's going on? This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 294. Yeah, we're knocking on episode 300, but we're here today to speak with Grandmaster John Graham. If you're new to the show, you might want to head on over to our website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com, where you can find show notes, photos, videos. This episode has some of both that will help give you more context into the lives of the people that we get to talk to. If you want to check out the products that we make, whether those are web products, like our free martialartscalendar.com, or some of the sparring gear, the apparel that we make, you can find all of that, links to everything that we do at our digital home, whistlekick.com. I hope you'll check that out. You can sign up for the newsletter. There's so much more going on over there. It would take way too long for me to tell you about all of it. So just go, just check it out, please. Please. (laughs) All right, enough of that. Let's talk about today's guest. I've known Grandmaster Graham a little bit, but for a couple years now, because of my involvement with the Superfoot Bill Wallace organization. Grandmaster Graham is an amazing martial artist. I've really enjoyed getting to know him. His skill is nothing short of incredible. And he is one of the few that has had the honor of training with both Grandmaster Wallace, Grandmaster Joe Lewis, as well as bringing in a traditional Chinese background. That's all given him quite a bit of context, not only for martial arts, but for life. And we talk about both of those in depth. He goes deep at times, he gets emotional, and it's really a wonderful episode, a conversation I thoroughly enjoyed. So I hope you will enjoy it as well. Here we go. Grandmaster Graham, welcome to Whistle Kick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much, Jeremy, and I had a great time with you at Terry's Symposium, and yeah. I thought it was an excellent, excellent venue, and everyone, uh, I'm hearing about the brotherhood and, and how everyone worked towards a common goal that was actualization of their martial arts goals. So yeah. it was a wonderful weekend. Yeah, he does put on a great event. Uh, so listeners, what Grandmaster Graham is referring to is Master Dow, Master Terry Dow, who has come up in conversation on here quite a bit. The man who works directly with me on, on the Superfoot kickboxing stuff. He had an event a couple weeks ago, and it was the first time I'd seen you in, in a little while. I think I hadn't seen you since... We were down at your school last year. Yeah, well, I got snowed out last time, so oh, I, I couldn't right. get there because of the snow last year. That's, that's right, because you are coming from? Mobile, Alabama, right. oh, as we call it down here, L.A. <laughs> Lower Alabama. Yeah. I, had a, I had a great time. I had a great time. And, yeah, I did. And, I did. You know, one of... One of the things, because people ask me, because I don't know a lot of people who have been to Alabama, so they would ask me, what was Alabama like? And the thing that struck me the most was here I am, I'm driving around in my rental car, and I don't quite know where I'm going. You know, I've got GPS, and it's more or less taking me where I'm going. But of course, when you're not sure exactly where you're going, you know, you don't, I don't don't know about you, I don't tend to push the speed limit. You know, I'm, I'm generally driving a little slower. Sometimes I'm in the left lane when I should be in the right lane. And... Not a single person was riding my butt or honking at me. Everybody was so nice, despite my complete ineptitude, driving in an area I didn't know. That's what we do. And and also, if there's a line, we'll let you in line easy. I mean, everybody leaves a gap. If you're like like on an excess road, they'll leave a gap between the excess road and you, so you can just pull right in the line. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's... uh, it's that southern hospitality. Yeah, it was you know? it was really nice. I, I have to say, I've lived in New England my whole life. I've done a fair amount of traveling, but I haven't been anywhere like this. And, yeah, you know, very low stress. It was great. Yeah, it's a slower pace of living, I That's would think. Sure. Yeah. That's for sure. Yeah. You do that up here, and, and you know, you, you, you're getting flipped off, and, and people are on your butt, and, you know... You, you do it the wrong part of, te- you know, various cities, wrong time of night, and, you know, they, it might turn into something even. Well, yeah, we're pretty cool down here. That, that air, Down south, everybody has a gun. <laughs> and uh, you, you can see shotguns in the, in the rear of uh, trucks. Yeah. 
so because everybody hunts, right. it's, it's kind of if you pull over a car, know that everybody's going to have a gun. So you're like, I better not do that. <laughs> yeah, we are a gun state, yeah, and not many shootings because of that. We we are we are not going to go there. We try to keep politics out of the show. Uh, you and I are are like minded in that, but there there's enough cause. I, I get I get enough. Uh, yeah. Not, a, not a ton of hate mail, but you know, let's let's keep this a reprieve from okay. from some of the some of the topical subjects sure. that are that are coming up. Yeah. Now you mentioned pulling over, so this is a good opportunity to mention that. In addition to being a martial artist, we're going to talk all about that. You've been involved in law enforcement. Yeah, I, I was 21 years uh, in in uh, Mo- I was with Mobile Police Department. And uh, I achieved the rank of lieutenant, which is a uh, unit commander. And I commanded patrol uh, and and a, and a uh, detective division, juvenile. While I was a lieutenant and a sergeant, I was in burglary and major crimes and uh, did stints in training where I was teaching self-defense. And so I got those, those different uh, aspects of police work, which was quite interesting especially the investigation part what was interesting about that well i mean when you when you look at uh when you look at a crime scene it it tells you a story kind of like a form does you know and so so you have to get into the form like you have to get into the crime scene to, to so it'll tell you what what it is and why it is and why it happened and and all the evidence points towards uh, the reasoning, just like when you do a form. So you have to dissect the crime scene and the, and the uh, perpetrator's motives and things like that. So like you would do, why did this guy create this form this way? You know, why did the, uh, the ancestors do it in this particular mode? Well, we do that in uh, police work, too. Same thing. So it's analyzation, analyzation of human nature. Now, of course, there is quite a bit of synergy between martial arts and law enforcement. You know, I've known a lot of martial artists that become law enforcement officers and a lot of law enforcement officers that, you know, they get some of their, their basic hand-to-hand training, some of their self-defense, and they find that they really enjoy it and they become martial artists. Other than, you know, the obvious, the the physical, just kind of raw similarity between, you know, the need to use your hands and in both disciplines what are some of the similarities is is there more to it than just that because you know i I've, I've never been a law enforcement officer but just hearing the way you and some of the other folks that i know have spoken about law enforcement it reminds me of martial arts well uh let me say this there is a rule of conduct that a law enforcement officer has to maintain i in other words when the threat is discontinued, we must discontinue force, no matter what is said to us or if the guy may even escalate force one second after he de-escalates, we have to be aware of that, where in the martial arts, uh, if you get attacked and you're not a police officer, you just do what you need to do so you you can go home. Well, we do the same thing, but we're, we're held to a higher standard when it comes to combat. That, that in, in particular, hand to hand, I I got rode up one time because I actually used my hand and broke my knuckle, and uh, my sergeant wrote me up because I didn't use my nightstick. <laughs> Damaged city property, as he said in the in the write up. <laughs> so it's it is a higher, different standard, you know. And, and there's if if you look at it first, you have verbal. Your mere presence is force, and then verbal, and then soft hand, hard hand, applications of of, of different, uh, you know, gas. Then you have uh, tasers, and then, of course, then you have nightstick, and then you have deadly force. So we have to go through all those continuums of force, whereas in, in, in a combat situation outside of law enforcement, it can go from here to there in a blink of a second and 
you don't have anything that you that you have to worry about. You just do it mm. and write, you know, and hopefully you don't get charged or whatever. So there there is a whole line of of things that we had to think about before we did anything. And that's a pretty interesting comparison, you know, one that I'm going to suspect most people listening hadn't considered, you know, as as martial artists, we are civilians. And despite the I, I think the myth is starting to fade, the idea that once we reach black belt, we have to register ourselves as a deadly weapon obviously isn't true. We are civilians with skill and, may, and maybe in a in a court, you know, there are times where we might be seen as as having had a little bit more responsibility because of our skill, but it is legally different for you as a law enforcement officer. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I have to justify even my verbal comments. Uh, so, you know, if my verbal comments escalate force, then I have to justify that. So it's, 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 it is a totally different world. When you're talking about a black belt or second, third degree, getting into a confrontation somewhere and he has to leg sweep, take a guy down, you don't have to put up with that kind of behavior. We are, if you cuss me out, I'm supposed to, it's not supposed to hurt my feelings. It's not even supposed to bother me because it's part of my job being cussed at. Mm -hmm. So, but if you, somebody walked up to you and said, Jeremy, you're an is da 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 and got in your face, you do something. Well, we can't. We just have to say yes, sir, yes, sir, yes, sir. Understand your feelings, and uh, okay, that's that's fine, and let it go. So it takes a whole lot of self discipline uh, and self preservation at the same time, because at the same time, I'm checking your hands out, I'm checking your blading of your body, I'm checking the tone, I'm seeing if you're making any kind of aggressive move as you're saying what you're saying, or are you just running your mouth, right? Well, you don't have to put up with that. You can just say you felt threatened and, and go for it. Yeah. How so has that position, that responsibility, that legal requirement changed your martial arts? Uh, well, it in, in my particular mindset is that I, I believe it or not I'm nonviolent so I, I don't I don't think it's changed me any it's just made me more responsible uh, and more tolerant of of people who have a tendency to want to you know start some trouble I remember I was riding and uh, my, my police car was broke so I was going down a, a road called Cottage Hill Road and these kids got beside me and they were doing the flip off thing and, the, and cuff it. I don't know what I did, but anyway, they started a fight and I had my police shirt off and I was a sergeant at the time. So first thing I did is I, I just picked up my shotgun and then I picked up my shirt cause we were at a red light and I went and I rolled my window down. I said, do you really want this trouble? And they said, <laughs> took off. So I mean, it was something out of a movie and, uh, but it really happened. Uh, so, you know, I mean, had I not been who I was, I think they probably would have got out of the car and tried to hurt me. Mm. You know, so that's, that's the way it is in, in uh, well, in most everywhere, you know. Yeah. They don't yeah, want to mess with idea. the police if they can. Generally a bad a bad idea. You're probably not going yeah. home <laughs> if you do. In, in one way or the other, you're probably not going home. Yeah, you, I'm, I'm definitely going to cuff and stuff you. You, if I have to put my hands on you, you're going to jail. Yeah. How'd you get started in martial arts? We're kind well, of flipping this today. I was, yeah, I was a boxer at, at age 14, 15 in Mo, Mobile, Alabama. And so I went in the Marines at 17. I quit high school. My, 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 my father basically told me Mount Meg, which is a home for wayward boys or the military, I tried to go in the Army because I was kind of scared of the Marines, but they wouldn't take me because uh, they said I needed to go back to high school and finish high school. And the Marines said, we got you. So I left that same day for boot camp. And uh, 
went up to Montgomery and failed my failed my test to go in the Marines. Uh, I'm shade colorblind, so they put a code on me and sent me to Jackson, Mississippi, where the lady uh, sat in front of the bubbles. I got these bubbles, and she did she did her fingers down three, two. I said thirty two, and she went through it like that. She goes, "Hey, your buys are great. Welcome, welcome to the U.S. Welcome to the U.S. military." And then I went straight to Paris Island. From there, never returned home for quite a while. And uh, and it was a life-changing experience uh, going into Marine Corps in 1970. It was, uh, it was something I needed, and it was something that I, I was proud I did, that I went into Marines, because once a Marine, always a Marine. You have that um, sense of pride and, and sense of... Uh, camaraderie. We still have reunions. Some of the guys that I worked with in London back in the early seventies. We meet up once a year. Mm-hmm. So I mean, that's that's the kind of brotherhood it is. Like like mar- like the martial arts. It's so much like Marines. It's so much like the martial arts. It's a family. And and I have a brother martial artist that I'm closer to than my own brothers and sisters. Uh, and that's fine with me. You know, that's the way. I think martial arts is and should be because we do share a common goal, which is, which is a love for movement and application and expression through movement. That's what I think martial arts is. Mm. That expression piece is one that's often not discussed. Tell it, tell us a bit more about what you mean there. Well, whenever, whenever I do like, let's say I'm doing a Joe Lewis module, uh, it, it could be 38, it could be whatever. When if, if I just walk through it and just kind of do the movements and I don't have any intention or or any any spirit behind it, warrior spirit behind it, then it's just movement. It's just frailing in the air. But when I put my emotional intent behind it with a the spirit of a warrior and survival behind it, now the techniques become much, much more full. They become something that someone has to deal with. And so that's, that's what I mean by that, a, a personal expression. Uh, and especially in Kung Fu forms, you have that, uh, this, that, that need to express what the creator of the form did. Was he trying to work on rhythm? Was he trying to work on... Uh, uh, angles. What was he trying to d- decipher through fighting? What what was it? And how do you attach yourself to his way of thinking so that you can decipher what he was trying to do? You know, I'm a uh, as as Joe Lewis used to say, I'm a student first, and once in a while, just every once in a while, a master, but more a student of movement. I, I love to watch ballet. Uh, it just intrigues me the way that they move and the flow and how they use their legs and their arms to create different uh, flow of energy. I just, I just absolutely love watching that. All right. So I think we might have gotten a little bit sidetracked, I mean, which is great. A hallmark of the show, these tangents. Now, you, you went into the service. And how did that connect? Yep. When, when did Kung Fu start for you? Well, I walked into uh, a USO and saw these guys doing uh, an art called Shobacon, which is an offshoot of Sh- Shobacon. And, and, and every kind of atom or fling in, in, in my being went, oh my gosh, you're home. This is who you are. This is where you've, you've been led to go. And ever since that day, I've I've never stopped. It's just been one beautiful journey after another of knowing who John Graham is and 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 his weaknesses and strengths and trying to work on uh, my strengths rather than my weaknesses and and then get people around me that have that. So that's when I started. I just walked in and there, and I knew I knew that I knew that I knew that that is was my life pursuit. Had you ever felt that feeling before? No, no, I, I, I did. I, no, not even I was a football player. I, I, I you know, a fairly good one, apparently. 
But when I walked into that room and saw that, my whole, I tell you, my whole mind, heart, and everything just came into alignment. And I go, that's me. That's where I'm supposed to do. This is my path. And I haven't veered from it in 50 years. I want to put that moment in in a bit of context because it's something that comes up on the show and not everyone has that experience. You know, some of us start really young and, you know, we don't have the life experience to be able to look at traditional martial arts and say, yes, this is something I want to do. This is something I belong in. You know, it's something that is, maybe we have a choice, but oftentimes the choice is presented as here's this fun thing that you could do. So I'm always intrigued when I speak with people who came to martial arts as adults. What had your experience, or I guess your knowledge of traditional martial arts been prior to walking into that school? Uh, None. I was a boxer. Uh, You hadn't watched any movies? You know, you you weren't a a big Billy Jack fan or something like that? Oh, it was way before Billy Jack. Okay. Uh, The Green Hornet had just started (laughs) and I thought Bruce Lee, I thought all that stuff was fake and staged. I didn't know a human being could really do that kind of stuff. You know, we didn't have any martial arts in mobile at the time. I think there was maybe a judo class at the YMCA maybe, but you know, I don't, nobody knew about it if there was. So we had a fairly big boxing community in, in, in mobile. So everybody that wanted that kind of, uh, pugilistic training would go to boxing. So I I just walked in there and I saw these guys kicking and doing these blocks and breathing and this moving and, and their, their, their folk mental focus. Uh, and it was just, wow, that is amazing to watch these human, these guys, these people, these human beings do something that in my mind was almost supermanish, you know? kicking that high and breaking boards and doing all the things because it was a demonstration. Uh, they were breaking boards and doing a lot of self-defense things. And I was like, Whoa, that's me. That's, that's how it happened. And, you know, and, and it's one of those things that, you know, when you, I guess a person picks up a pen and they start to write and the, and the story writes itself in front of them. Uh, and they say, I don't know, I just put the pen to paper and it wrote itself like, like Stallone did when he wrote Rocky. That's the way I felt. I just knew that, I knew that this journey was my journey in the, in the life that I was given. What did the next few months look like? You've walked into this school, it's completely resonated for you. This is the place that you need to be, I believe were your words. So what did your training... Uh, become did you start immediately and throw yourself at it or? yeah okay yeah the, the, I, and and the guy said sit in the corner and i said okay they said the next two weeks he put me in a horse stance and then the next two weeks he taught me how to do the you know the karate punch and then two weeks after that back in the day people tried to run you off you know, it was to see if you had the stick to itness to stay. So, and he told me I'd never be a black belt. Uh, you know, I didn't have the stretch, and why am I wasting his time and all this stuff like that? And I'm like, well, I mean, you you don't make that choice for me. I'm going to stay. And then that guy got transferred out, and a kind of a nicer teacher came to the USO, and. You know, I stayed with him, and then I got transferred somewhere else in the Marine Corps and then met another really good instructor. And But, uh, you know, the, he couldn't run me off because I knew, I knew that that was what I was supposed to do. And if that's how I got there, standing in a stance, in a horse stance, well, that's what I was going to do. And that's, that was it, you know. Was, wasn't any choice anymore because I knew that I knew that I knew. And you said that was for the first couple of weeks. So what did the next, you know, what did it look like after that? Well, then I had to stand in a uh, horse dance and throw punches. Then for another month, I did upper blocks. And then I had to just stand in his incusadachi stance, a forward leaning stance, and just step 
not even punch and do that. So it was like six months of I learned a horse stance, forward leaning stance, reverse punch, and an upper block, and that was it. Wow. And the classes were an hour and a half. And we did a whole lot of calisthenics and things like that. And that was, I don't know if he didn't know how to teach. I mean, it was, it was so many, it was 1971. Uh, so yeah, I didn't, you know, it, it was all kind of new back then. It was a, he was a Navy guy and I was in the Marines and, you know, the Navy and Marine Corps aren't, uh, back then we weren't all that friendly towards each other, but it didn't bother me any, but I guess it, I don't know if it bothered him, but. But it was just one of those things that, you know, other people would come in and they'd been training before and they would just, they'd learn a whole lot of other stuff. I had to teach myself the coptis just by watching them because I was just standing there and I would learn them that way. So, you know, I think what it did was, for me, it just created a resolve. It created a stubbornness inside of me that, that Bernard, I'm going to do this. And there's nobody's going to stop me, and I'm not going to take rejection, uh, you know, because I've I'm, uh, I've done a little acting, I've done like 13 movies, and I've been turned down of about 50 of them before I did the 13. So, you know, rejection is part of acting and that that, and that particular thing. So, I, you know, so I was, you know, like I don't care how many times you reject me, I'm still going to be here, and I'm still going to learn what you've got to offer. And that's that's the way I've always done it. And I was lucky to go to uh, Camp Lejeune where they had martial arts like crazy. And then I went on a ship and then uh, we went to Charleston where they had martial arts. Everybody did martial arts in the Navy and Marine Corps back then. And so it was a community and it was a lot better. So I'm glad I didn't wasn't run off. And, he, and like I say, he couldn't run me off. That wasn't it. That wasn't uh on the table for me. So you start out with so this out. karate, this sort of Shotokan derivative, as you call it. Mm-hmm. What were some of the other things that you, you studied? Because I'm getting the sense that as you're moving around, you're being exposed to different arts. And, you know, I, I'm, I, know, I know you a bit now, and I know you as a rather diverse martial artist. So, so I'm going to guess that it was through that moving around that those seeds were planted for, for being open to so many different things? Yeah, I studied, have a brown belt in Tetsu Ken, which is uh, uh, a hybrid uh, art out of Japan. I have a uh, brown belt in Kempo, a black belt in Kokushinkai, uh, a second degree in KENPO, uh, a right under black belt in KEMPO. And then um, I, I studied uh, Shaolin Wuzhu Chen. I was studying with Steve Morris, who was the chief instructor of the Goju Ru, who I have a EQ uh, uh, with him. Uh, and this Chinese guy was coming to town. And I just walked by this, this uh, magazine rack and saw, you know, Chinese grandmaster coming to London. So I said, hmm, that was 1974, and I'd been trained a few years. So I went and watched him, and uh, so they invited me to the house, and uh, he was about 53 years old, and I thought this, you know, and I'm t- 21 at the time, been trained a few years, and so they said, uh, you know, you're, you're a strong karate guy, throw a punch, and so I threw a punch at him, and he slung me against the wall with his fingers, and I was like, what the heck? So I told him I wasn't ready, and he just laughed. The next thing I know, my head is on his toe, on his big toe, and he just popped me in the nose with it, got up and said, and told him, this, the translator, I like this guy. He doesn't take no for an answer, and he doesn't, and, and he wants to be, wants us to prove that we know what we're doing, not just accept it. So then I studied, started studying Kung Fu at that point in time. That was 74. Shaolin Wushu Chen, and I knew that it was the father of karate. I, I just knew it because I'd studied those five different karate forms and had never been taught out of China. Uh, I was the first group to learn it in London because it was a, you had to be pure Chinese to learn Wushu Chen. 
it was called Five Ancestors. And our, our Grand Master, who was living in Malaysia, wasn't under the same rules as the Grand Masters in China. Uh, and the ones in the United States wouldn't teach anybody that wasn't pure Chinese. So he, he kind of broke the mold and started teaching us us guys. Uh, and as make a long story short, I became a disciple of his and an d- adopted son and stayed with him for years and years, about 27 years before he died. Uh, and I was uh, in London, and I watched Bill Wallace uh, beat up the guy from Germany, and the, and the Brits are going, well, you know, he's supposed to kick so fast, this, that, and the other, right? Well, well, well uh, Grandmaster Wallace knocked the guy out within seconds, right? And I told my Marine Corps buddies who was watching it with me, I said, I'm going to meet him one day, and I'm going to be one of his students, and I'm going to teach with him. And they went, man, you're so full of crap. Well, actually, one of the guys that was in London moved to Mobile uh, right down the road and told Wallace the story. And that was, and it came to fruition 1988. Bill and I met, and I started studying with him. And then right after that, I started studying with Joe. Joe Lewis was down here too. But my whole deal was I wanted to learn there was something about Bill Wallace, the way he moved, the way he uh, addressed situations in the ring, and just his his mythology is what I wanted to to learn. So I've been uh, an avid student of his for that many years, and then obviously Joe Lewis as, as well. So, but I still kept my kung fu going. And when they started the international organization in 1990, I started going to China, and I've been going there ever since. And uh, the Chinese, I was voted the 11th president, which was, I I got voted vice president, and they said, look, we can't vote you president because it's a totally Chinese organization, and you obviously aren't Chinese. So, (laughs) Uh, and I went, well, that's true. So all the countries got together and said, you know, John does our Wu Su Chen and and we we want him to become president. So it happened. I was the eleventh president, the first ever non Chinese to be voted uh and take over a Chinese organization that that was in uh the twentieth anniversary, which was a huge one, uh and we got to I got to open up a sports center and was actually part of the Chinese government for the time I was over there. Oh, wow. <laughs> And then after that, they said, okay, all presidents are promoted to Grand Master. They said, oh, we can't do that. Beijing won't let us. So they went to Beijing, and uh, everybody, da, 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 da. And make a long story short, I was promoted to 10th Dan uh, a year later by the Chinese government. I was a ninth at the time. Uh, and so and that's that's how I got my my tenth degree from from the Chinese government. I guess the right time at the right place. You know, had it been thirty years earlier, then that would have happened. Did you feel a sense a, a different sense of responsibility? Mm, it's the wrong way to ask a question. What was it like being that first non Chinese person entrusted with something that not only mattered to you but to so many others? You know, it was a, it was an honor, and a, and a responsibility that I knew that I could, that I wanted to do, and I wanted to make sure that the the people that came before us were honored, and that we didn't forget them, and so it was, it, to me, it was an honor and a responsibility, you know. So I, I took it head on, and and. You know, and I, like this year, I'm going back to the Philippines. We're having a big meet in the Philippines. I go every year, uh, and it's just they're they, they've all become like brothers to me. So it's it's fun. I mean, it's just, and I even went over there one time, and they had a they were going to teach kung fu to the schools over there, and I was asked to go with the board of education and a bunch of kung fu masters, well, seven of us, and I've got it on film where I was giving input into how to teach on in China to the Chinese kids Kung Fu. 
which was a weird thing for me to be doing, but they asked me to do it, so I did it, and it was really kind of cool. So they don't they don't look at me now as anything other than a brother. And I've noticed that with the martial arts, you know, ethnicity, uh, religion, none of that matters when you have a common goal and a common cause that overrides all that ignorance that some other people have that we in the martial arts uh, put aside. Absolutely. So we're here we are, we have a pretty good context for who you are. We, we've, we've heard about your origin story, your beginnings in martial arts and a bit of time in military and law enforcement. We've constructed a pretty good platform. And we've taken some steps, we've heard some stories from you, but now I'm going to ask for a story specifically. If you had to give a speech or something, it's kind of what you're doing now, I guess, and present your favorite martial arts story from your time. What story would that be? Mm. I think it, my, my, my actual favorite one was, is when I met Master Chi and, and then my, when, how he kind of just twisted my hand and put me on the ground. That was, that was, uh, amazing to me that you could accept somebody's forward motion and divert it in a way that unbalanced them and do it without much effort. Because, you know, I was used to the banging arms and banging, you know, the, the Shotokan type stuff and the Goju. So that that's one of my favorite stories. But another one is when I was sparring with Bill Wallace, uh, or I wasn't sparring with him. We were working out. <laughs> I don't you know, spar with Bill Wallace. And, and he kept hitting me with a hook kick. So I'd say, do it again, do it again, do it again. And then finally I said, I can't see it. And he leaned over and 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 kissed me on the forehead and said, you're not supposed to. And just giggled. <laughs> and I went, yes, sir. <laughs> and that was, that was it. And a, a, another funny one was when I tested for my sixth with Joe Lewis, uh, uh, he, he pounded me so hard that my wife had to help me out of the car for two days. I mean, my absolute insides were like jello, but I, I did the rounds with the champ, you know, and, uh, hung in there with him. Not, I, I wouldn't no call it a hang in there with him. He, he, he mercifully didn't kill me, but <laughs> that was, uh, that was such an honor to, to glove up and, and work, in that situation and have him promote me to six degree after beating the snot out of me and checking out my, checking my oil. If you, I guess you could say, <laughs> but, but it was amazing. It was amazing. I wouldn't trade those two buck whippings for nothing. <laughs> now here you just so kind of uh, told two anecdotes, one about Bill Wallace, one about Joe Lewis, really opposite ends of the spectrum. And, Two men that I know have been tremendously influential, not only on your career, your time in the martial arts, mine, so many others, people that we know in common, people that we don't. I'm sure a lot of the listeners out there have looked to one or both of those gentlemen as inspirations in their martial arts training. But yeah. one of the things that and we don't know, talk about much on the show is the fact that they were amazing friends, best friends, despite being philosophically like that, so different. And I'm wondering, because you knew both of them well, could you speak to that? I, you know, I sure can. And I, and I really appreciate you asking me that question. Bill Wallace is great as a fighter that he is today and was during his career. Always looked as, at Joe because he started eight months earlier as his senior. And always treated him that way. They were brothers. They would, if you ever had them at a seminar together, the whole time you're laughing, they're playing off each other. They knew each other's thoughts. They were that close. In fact, the word seminar, Joe Lewis created. Uh, back, back, they didn't have such things back in the day. So, and him and, him and Bill Wallace did seminars all over the world together. They did, 
10 or 11 here at my school, and every weekend they were together. So it's a, when we put together the Superfoot Joe Lewis organization, I, I challenge anybody to find anyone that, that trained as much and watched Joe Lewis more than Bill Wallace. Bill has a love for Joe as a brother loves a brother. And it is shown in his respect and his honor and him desiring to keep Joe's legacy alive and moving towards uh, empathy as as his legend should as well. But he's put, again, there's Bill Wallace putting somebody else. Bill Wallace don't have to do that. He doesn't have to. He doesn't have to say anything about anybody because he's Bill Wallace. But that's not Bill. Bill says, I want to make sure that my brother, my friend, my, my, it's almost like soulmate, if you, if you, if you don't un- if you kind of get that, yeah, yeah. I want to make sure his leg- legacy stays alive as well as mine with me. And that kind of love is, is amazing to me. I mean, and it's out of love that he's doing it. Because he doesn't have to. So the new Superfoot Joe Lewis organization is one that was created out of love for Joe Lewis. And we're all Joe Lewis guys, but we're also Superfoot guys. So the whole organization is a commitment to two of the greatest fighters I have ever seen. And I've been to Japan. I've been to Okinawa. I've been all over Europe. And I've seen a whole lot of people from from Dominic Valera on up, I mean, all of them, you just don't see those type of type A personalities, those forces of nature that can come together in the brotherhood that they had. And that in itself is amazing. Absolutely. That's, that's my take on it. (laughs) Yeah. Now, of course, I'm fortunate enough, and most of the listeners know, unless you're new, most of the listeners know that, I've been fortunate enough to have not only met Bill Wallace, but, you know, get to train with all of you and, and get kind of pulled into the organization. And, and there are days that I wake up and I, I still have a hard time believing that this has happened. But I've come to understand a bit of the way that Bill looks at Joe. One of the things that I'm not familiar with that I'd love to hear from you, because I can't think of anyone better to ask this question. How did Joe look at Bill? Oh, my gosh. He looked at Wallace as a phenomenon. He really did. Now, uh, whenever I spoke about, because Joe would stay, uh, Grandmaster Lewis would stay at my house uh, quite a lot, and uh, not like he did Mike Allen, but he would he would stay stay with me, you know, come in early, leave late, and and we we would talk about, you know. And I remember, not not to digress, but I remember one day he was, uh, I have a two-story house, so he was, he looked down at me, and he just wrote that book, Me and Bruce Lee. Yeah. And and he says, you want to, you want to know the story about Bruce Lee? And I said, does a, does a, does a bear uh, use a bathroom in the woods? Uh, he said, on a regular basis. I said, yes, sir. So I asked my, my, my wife to stay in the kitchen. And so she would listen. And during the conversation, about Bruce Lee, Wallace would always come up. So, you know, it would come up, you know, what, you know, Joe did it, uh, Bruce Lee did this way, and then Bill would do it this way, and then, you know, so he always had this Bill's abilities as being something that he had not inspired to be like, but but he saw as as almost superhuman the way that Wallace did what he did. Right. And there was never a jealousy and there wasn't a time where he would ever, you know, like some guys would go, you know, well, Wallace is good kicker, but he can't take a punch. I never heard him say anything other than wonderful things about, about Bill and about his humor and how they would get together and banner off each other at a seminar. I don't know, Jeremy, if you ever got the, train with both of them at the same time. It didn't. But you, you, you couldn't help but laugh. I mean, you learn so much 
and Wallace would come on the floor and just mess up Joe's seminar, right? And then, of course, you know, uh, there was Joe, and he would do the same thing to him, but they were both putting up points together and ideas and playing off the, the concepts of fighting in a humorous way that brought out different views, if you, if you can understand what I'm saying. Absolutely. And it was, it was amazing to see these two champions communicate through movement and, and, and put their egos aside. And I got pictures of Bill putting his head on Joe's shoulder and then, you know, and Joe and Bill kissing him on the cheek and, 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 and vice versa. I mean, it was, it was one of those, I don't know how to say it other than Wallace and Lewis were Abbott and Costello. They were Dean Martin and Jerry Lewis. They were a team, inseparable by egos and by uh, technique. Does that make sense? It does. And that, you know, I've had the, the good fortune to speak with a number of people who knew both gentlemen. Probably not. I'm, I'm going to guess I haven't spoken with anyone who knew both of them as long as you have. And one of the things that I, I regret is that, you know, I will, I will never have been able to train with Joe, Joe Lewis personally, but in being able to train with folks like Grandmaster Wallace and yourself, you know, I, I'm, I'm able to construct a bit of a picture that, you know, lines up with things that I've, of course, read and, and seen. But I don't think I've ever heard a more succinct, more, I suspect, accurate description of the two of them as what you just said that, that, that's pretty powerful stuff well i want the listeners to know this that who i am and the way i view martial arts even though i love my chinese teacher he was like a father to me those two gentlemen have given me more opportunities more pep talks more making me feel important and loved and cared about. I'm getting a little emotional here. Hold on. Uh, then, then, then anybody, even my own father. And when you, when you get that kind of love from somebody who is at their level and you know that they're sincere, it's amazing, Jeremy. And, and I was so blessed to have that from, from both of them. I lost a dear, dear, dear friend when he died, and and a mentor, and a, and a guy that I looked up to, and he would sit at my house, and we would just tell jokes, and we'd just be two old old Marines sitting around, and then we start doing martial arts, and it was just amazing. I I I, I don't know, man. I was I'm so blessed. I I don't know how to say it other than. You know, there's a, there's a, sometimes God puts his hands in places, you know, and he blessed me with those two men in my life that helped me through a lot of things that I was going through as a young police officer. They were there for me. In fact, they both went on a ride along with me when I was a sergeant. What was that like? <laughs> oh, hilarious. Hilarious! Pull this one over. Pull that one over. No, I ain't doing nothing. They started in the back of my squad car. I said, "You two, shut the hell up!" <laughs> I'm trying to listen to my radio. I got men I got to take care of. Oh, it was freaking crazy fun, you know. I, 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 golly, it was just. And then, then Joe rode with me a couple times when when Bill wasn't down here. Uh, you know, he'd come when Bill wasn't here, and then vice versa. And then they'd come together. Uh, 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 Joe would call me. I'm coming to town in uh, in four days. I need a seminar. Yes, sir. And I put together a seminar for him, and we we'd have a great time. And he'd just be on point. And uh, I say, Hey, I'm working tonight. Yeah, let's go. And he'd jump in his. I'd, I'd get permission from my lieutenant because I was a patrol sergeant. And uh, oh, sure, yeah. So <laughs> off we'd ride. <laughs> and uh, he, all, was, he was he uh, was uh, huh? with all the stories that I've heard from you and others. The idea of those two gentlemen in some kind of buddy cop movie TV show, I, I think, just writes itself. I can actually see it. 
Yeah, you would. I mean, it was. It was crazy. I had to tell them, you guys get back in the car. This is a crime scene. I mean, they were like, wow, wow, wow. It was just hilarious. Oh, my God. I mean, you know, they didn't get involved in any. They, they didn't overstep their bounds. And they really didn't. They were gentlemen. They, they, they understood that. You know, I had to supervise crime scenes and this, that, and the other, and accidents and things like that. But just, you know, they're, they're wow, John, that's uh, that's some heavy stuff, you know, and this, that, and the other. And how do you deal with that? And, you know, because we had a, a, a couple that didn't make it on some situations. I'll just leave it at that. And, and we talked through that. Like, all three of us just talked through that kind of stuff because, you know, Joe was in Vietnam and, and so we had those kind of conversations. I mean, just just conversations that I that I, I cherish and that it that pop up in my mind at the craziest times, you know. Uh, and some people say I move like Joe Lewis uh, because I'm built a little like him, uh, and that's the biggest compliment I've ever ever heard, you know. Uh, and so I I just had a blessed life when it comes to teachers, uh, and I am a conglomerate of those two wonderful human beings that shared with me their knowledge and their friendship and their camaraderie. And it don't get any better than that. It does not. Now, obviously, that's a wonderful foundation. I mean, just to learn from those two gentlemen, but also your Chinese instructor. Mm -hmm. If you were to add somebody else... Sorry, go ahead. And, and and he knew I was training with them, uh, and he was like, "Great, what a good idea." He, he was that kind of because a lot of times it, I got to say something about martial artists, and and they they think their way is the only way, and that you should only follow one path. Well, I can get to Mississippi by airplane, by car, by bike, by motorcycle, by boat, but I'm still going to end up in Mississippi. They ain't got to walk. And that, the way you get there doesn't matter. What matters is if you get there. And that's the way my Chinese instructor looked at it, was movement was movement. And that's the way Bill and Joe looked at it. That's why they didn't care what art you studied. They just cared whether you got their concept or not. Uh, and who else would I want to train with would yeah. probably be Chuck, maybe Chuck Norris or, or I, 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 I he he uh, he he was fascinating. In fact, that he was a point fighter that that was a that was uh, top of the line. I trained with Skipper Mullins. I've trained with uh, uh, I've trained with uh, Benny the Jet, uh, who is amazing. I've trained with Cynthia Rothrock. Did two movies with her down here in Mobile. Um, so I've met a lot of them, you know, and and I still go back to my two my two guys. You know, I mean, all those guys have a lot of talent, but when the word connection, see, because a student, a student to me has to choose his teacher, but the teacher has to choose the student too. And that is sometimes a, a misnomer or, or, or misconnection between two people, right? The instructor and the student or student and the instructor. And when you get that, that for lack of a better word, that marriage, uh, you cherish it and you keep it going. So those two guys, uh, everybody else would have been uh, icing on the cake or or maybe just dessert or whatever. But as long as I had those two as a fun, my fundamentals and and my sounding board and helping me through, because I got some stuff one time and uh, and I called Joe about it, called uh, Grandmaster Lewis, and I told him, and the guy calls me up and he goes. Okay, okay, I'm letting you out of everything. Just get that son of a gun off my butt, please. <laughs> and because Joe called, you mess with one of my boys. And he goes, you don't mess with one of my guys. And when you were Joe's guy, you were Joe's guy. And Bill's the same way. I mean, Bill was absolutely the same way, but Joe was adamant about it. He just didn't mess with one of his guys. And hell of, hell of high water, he was with you. And he wouldn't. He would stand beside you, guns blazing. It didn't matter what it was. He was there. 
And when you get that kind of commitment from another human being, you, you put it in the cherished part of your memory and your heart. <laughs> of course. Now, you've talked a little bit about the movies that you've done. You mentioned that you did a couple with Cynthia Rothrock. And let's, let's take a step out of memory lane, you know, as it relates to Grandmasters Wallace and Lewis. Talk a little bit about some of these other elements to your, your training, your history. Movies. Well, uh, Mobile is a right-to-work state. So, in other words, uh, they can shoot movies down here cheaper. And so we've, we've had quite a few movies shot down here. Uh, Sally Fields has got one, and, and, and a lot of people have uh, something of the third kind, that big Steven Spielberg movie we shot here. Uh, I ended up becoming a stuntman and did some movies with some low budget, but they were – they were still they still, they got out and uh, and I actually produced a movie called The One Warrior with Dave and David Jason Franks the Green Ranger and uh, it it got sold in twenty countries and I did some stunts in it but I've been thrown against walls I've had my I've been shot through a plate glass window which was amazing uh, with machine gun squibs on my chest I was. Uh, leg chopped off by an alien and had to use a trampoline and flip through the air. So that that's my movies. I'm not an actor. I was more of a stunt man that would have a line or two and then get killed. Uh, so uh, they were, you know, felony was one of them. Uh, there was just I didn't even, I can't remember all the names right off the top of my head because it's been quite a few years since I've done a movie. I still do a little print ad stuff or commercial once in a while, but I'm. You know, I'm 65 years old. Who the heck wants to look at me, you know? so <laughs> As you're talking about being thrown around and beat up and sent through plate glass windows, I'm thinking that your time working with Bill Wallace and Joe Lewis probably prepared you for a bit of that. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, we were so low budget in this one movie uh, that the, the plate, the glass, came in, it was sugar glass, obviously. Uh, and so the guy goes, the, the director, David Pryor, goes, uh, okay, I got one piece of glass. It costs $2,500. We got one cut. If you mess it up, I'm not paying you, and I'm barring you from movies. <laughs> I said, no pressure, huh? He said, yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> so off it went, and I threw myself through that, you know, the squib hit, and I, I threw myself back on the pad. You know, they had a brake pad in the back, and and. I was laying there, and nobody said anything, and I was like, uh-oh, something happened. And I stood up, and everybody started clapping, so I was like, whew, dang, I did that one. So that was fun. <laughs> that was just that. so much fun. Do you respond well under pressure? Uh, yes. I, that that has to do with, yeah. Anytime my guys had a, we had a hold, a, ro- a bank robbery, or, or, or let's say a shooting, or something like that, I could call in the block off the streets, uh, tell them where to go, how to how, how to do it, and I'd get right there and go. And uh, that's just always been something I learned, I guess, was taught in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Uh, pressure brings the best out in me. I don't shut down. I go to work. You mentioned yeah. your age, so I'm, I'm not asking it. But here you are. You've accomplished oh. a tremendous amount for a man who's 65 years old. I mean multiple black belts training with arguably two of the best martial artists to ever live movies. You have your own school, you have a family, you had a career in law enforcement, but here, you know, at a, I mean, for, for our region here in new England, you know, a reasonably large event, just a couple weekends ago, you flew up, you know, I got to see you, you were there, you were participating. Clearly you have a love for martial artists, for, I'm sorry, for martial arts, but are there things that are keeping you going beyond that? You know, you don't conduct yourself as a man who's going through the motions. It looks like there's still stuff that you're looking to do. Mm-hmm. So what what are those goals? Where is that motivation coming from? Yeah. Um, quite simply, I made a commitment to to Joe Lewis and to Bill Wallace. And 
that's a personal commitment that I made to both of them, and in particular to to Joe Lewis, and and I'm going to do it. And his his if I can help it in any way, as long as I'm alive, the name Joe Lewis will never ever be off people's lips. And his ability to teach and the way that he taught will be on the table. And I don't care if I'm 70, 75. If I can still do it, I'm going to do it. And I want his name to live in, to to always be remembered by these young guys to realize where they came from, the sweat and the and the and the stuff that those guys had to put up with when they started kickboxing. I mean, they were rejected by traditionalists. They were, you know, what what I'm doing is, is nothing compared to what those guys had to put up with to get where we're at today. And as long as John Graham's breathing. I'm going to be a cheerleader for those two guys and, and do the best I can to keep their legacy going. Phenomenal stuff. And as someone who values both of them, I appreciate that that is so important yes, to sir. you. And, and, and fortunately, you're not the only one who cares about the yes. two of them so much. That's right. If anyone's listening, if they want to, you know, see more about what's going on with you, you know, uh, website, social media, you know, how can people find you online? Uh, I have a YouTube channel, uh, Master Graham, uh, and I, I do post Kung Fu videos, uh, like I taught the two-man staff, the two-man uh, heavy hand set at the, at the symposium. Yep. That's on there if they wanted to go on and look at that. And then some of my performances in China are on, on the YouTube channel. And cool. some of Joe and Bill's stuff is on there. So uh, it's, a, it's a lot of things. So you can just go to Ma- Master Graham on YouTube, and I'll pop up. And uh, that's that's the way to get to know me, really. Okay, great. And, of course, if anyone out there is new to the show, I'll have, find a, a direct link to that. Link it from the show notes at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And, you know, we'll we'll drop some other stuff in there, some, some videos. There's, I've got some ideas, especially as it relates to these two wonderful gentlemen we've spoken about quite a bit today. Give you, some, give you some more context for who you are, Grandmaster Graham, because, I, you know, you certainly started martial arts before you met them, but I think it's safe to say that who you are was tremendously, maybe even un, unimaginably, shaped by your relationships with the two of them. Yep. You hit it right on the head. It sure was. What a blessed life I've had. You know, it's just been an amazing road and I'm not through yet. You know, I'm only 65 and I look at Wallace and I go, you're not human. You know, what are you, 72? You're still kicking me in the ribs like you remember when he kicked me in the ribs at the conference? I sure do. <laughs> <laughs> I said, man, I, I felt my kid, kidney quiver. What the hell? <laughs> no. I'm sorry. Well, I did step forward into it, you know. I did step forward on the jab, which it, which if I hadn't have done that, he'd have hit me harder because I didn't step forward. So I stepped into it. So I, I can't really blame you, uh, Grandmaster Wallace, for that. It was me too. <laughs> I, I will share one moment, you know, that that occurred between you and I, and and you did promise to get me for this, and maybe I'm I'm being foolish in bringing it back up, but um, <laughs> Grandmaster Wallace had had demonstrated something by slapping you across the shoulder. And it was clear that it stung, and you made a face. And so, me being, you know, kind of the young guy in the group, kind of the smart, smart Alec, says, I- I'm sorry, sir, I couldn't see that. And he didn't just slap you one more time. It was like another 12 times. And just, and the look on your face, I know the next time we're in the same room together, I'm going to get it. Oh, yeah. It'll remain to be seen whether or not it'll be worth it, but I just... You know, I, I'm willing to own up to the things that I do. And, and, and listeners, I think it's it, that right there. It's a great testament to the culture that Grandmaster Wallace and, you know, still the legacy of the culture that Grandmaster Lewis set down among the people that follow their, their instruction. You know, it's not just training. It's fun. It's building yeah. that familial relationship that you've spoken about so much today see to me when you said that 
that meant that you were getting something out of it and that I didn't mind getting hit by him because because you were engaged you see nice. you were you you were listening you were you were, you you wanted to to kind of make things happen so I wasn't really ha- upset. I was happy that you did that because I wish more people would do that. I mean, not that I like getting kicked in the head by Wallace, but let me tell you this, Jerry, I am going to hook kick you to the back of your head. That, that's fair. Uh, well and deserved. I'm going to be standing shoulder to shoulder, and I'm going to pop you upside your head like I did Anthony. So, <laughs> <laughs> so it's going to be I love, though, Jeremy. Fair Just enough. think of it that way. Fair enough. <laughs> yeah. This has been a lot of fun. I always ask the guests yeah. to send us out kind of in the same way. What advice, what parting words would you share with the listeners? If you're a martial artist, you're a martial artist. You are a martial artist in your heart, your soul, your actions, your influence matters. So you have to be very careful when you're out and around because you represent a whole culture of people. So be be careful, have fun, but remember who you are and never forget the people who got you there. If you listen to this episode and you got the sense that Grandmaster Graham is a good man, you'd absolutely be right. From the first moment I met him to the subsequent times I've met him to our conversation, even our messages leading up to recording this episode, he was nothing if not courteous and humble and absolutely accommodating in a way that very few people of his standing and skill are these days. Maybe it's his Southern upbringing, or I would like to think more so, it's just that he's a good man. Thank you, Grandmaster Graham, for coming on the show. As I said in the intro, there are photos, there are videos, there is so much more social media, a lot of it going on at the show notes for this episode 294, Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio.com. You can find all of our products, everything else we've got going at whistlekick.com. Sign up for the newsletter. And if you want to follow us on social media, you can do so at Whistlekick. If you want to get me directly, go ahead, email me, Jeremy at whistlekick.com. I thank you for your time. Thank you for the honor of sharing some of your finite amount of your day listening to my voice listening to these episodes. I appreciate it. It means the world to me. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.